warm welcome back to what happens to be our 243rd episode of Human Humane Architecture here on Think Tech Hawaii. And you are about to be our 13,000th viewer. So that's great to have you with us. And we is us at the same place at our town of Honolulu, Hawaii, with you, DeSoto Brown, in your Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Good day to everybody who is watching this, and hello, Martin. And me in the foothills of our Diamond Head, where you occasionally are broadcasting from as well, with way more tropical exotic backgrounds <laughs> of your birds and your dogs. And unfortunately, at your workplace, you have to silence yourself and to dress up warm, because yeah. although we foster a natural air condition, uh, trade winds, uh, that's not working at your workplace is one of the few exceptions to the rule, we have to say. And that's let's right. put the first slide up because the content we're talking on a geopolitical stage is still pretty doomy because we're still, besides having climate change, uh, COVID cases are rising. And on top of that, we have a war going on over at where I just came back from, back in Europe, uh, in the Ukraine, as we all know. And uh, this pair of picture here, we want to get right or make sure you don't get us wrong. Uh, before we even start talk about this one here, what's the worst is talking the human and humane um, topic of the show, tragedies that happen behind these demonstrations, the lives lost, the pain that will can never be repaired, uh, versus glass can, buildings you can rebuild, but lives that are lost and, um, you know, sanities, they're basically, um, you know, uh, destroyed, can't, can't be repaired and replaced. So let's keep that in mind when we talk about it. But then uh, we choose this picture from the web uh, on the left from already, uh, you know, very sadly, a while ago, uh, mid-March, of uh, unlike the opening pictures of the previous shows where the buildings were either totally destroyed, bombed away, or their fenestration was totally gone. This is one here where, where it shattered, and it could have been a picture of somewhere in our fellow tropics in Florida. There was one a while ago, not long ago, after a hurricane, and it looks like. So again, while we say over there, now we're getting out of the winter, maybe this Building is not the best example because there's summer as well coming up. And uh, then the glass curtain wall doesn't uh, be so convenient either. Just like we have summer here all year round. But in the winter time, as we remember uh, me personally and you from your growing up partly in the cold DeSoto, you need that existentially. While here, as we keep uh, talking, discussing, we don't need it primarily. So on the right side, there's one of our recent high rises going up. So in the Ukraine, they're going down. Here, they're going up. And uh, in the Ukraine, you need the uh, enclosure, the fenestration. Here, you wouldn't need it. That's the irony of things that we kind of are um, recognizing uh, when we think and talk about this. The picture we took on the right side um, is where the Soto. That is one of the new buildings that's coming up in Kaka'ako, part of the uh, Howard Hughes development. And this is what, Koula? This is that, that one. And it, uh, yeah. it has an exterior that is purportedly based on sugarcane, sugarcane stalks, sugarcane leaves. We don't really see that. I don't really see that. Uh, I think that that's just um, a decorative ex expression of what the architect was wanting to get across. And as we always talk about, if you're going to put something on the outside of the building, it needs to be performative. It shouldn't just be there to look pretty. Now, it's not bad to have interesting looking buildings that aren't just big rectangles. At the same time, however, what's the livability and what is the carbon footprint and how much energy is being used? That's the thing that we hammer away at here on Human Humane Architecture. And you don't want things that are just wavy for the sense of looking wavy. It needs to be there for a reason. Yeah, and while our um, Easy Breezy uh, or our PI Mobile, which you see in the very front, uh, is Easy Breezy again from when you took care yes. of it when I was gone, and we yes. took the rule yes. off. 
the Kula uh, at least has, we won't call it lanai's because they're not deep enough, they're not generous enough, they're not shading enough, but they're balconies. But the one that you see the construction fence and it's just coming out of the ground is the so-called Victoria Place, which we said we agreed uh, Victoria Ward might turn around in her grave because we said it has little to nothing to do with her culture because this one won't even have any lanides. It's all glazed, it's all hermetic, it's all exclusive. And that is really kind of tragic. Um, you might think now, um, you know, why are we getting these things uh, from architects who actually are not from here, which Ginny uh, Gang, who is the architect of the Kula, is from Chicago, and we can go to the next slide, uh, because also the Victoria Place that we see here in a previous show quote that we were examining that at the top right, uh, and also their first uh, project for Howard Hughes was the Anaha, which we always feel is like intestines more than anything else. Also uh, free of any lanai's, uh, totally glazed, but uh, wants to make these sort of funky formal moves. They are very, very expensive on a high price. So one should have better afforded lanai's for that. And also uh, a project by them, we sort of drove, uh, just drove by. And, and by the way, um, we're talking about the Ala Moana area and how much that was impacting the name of the mall is impacting that area is they even named the main through fair, the road, Alamana Boulevard after it, right? And the other project- No, actually, the, the, actually the, the road came first and then came Alamana oh, Center. Oh, that's a little better or much better, actually. Thanks for- It is much better because Alamana means beachside road. Okay, so I'm, I feel better now. And that's how they were doing it. I mean, that came from mid-century and mid-century they made more sense. So uh, yep. these three buildings, the Victoria Place to come in under construction, the Anaha, and then what they call the Park Lane, which is that uh, addition on above the mall, built on the mall at the corner of P.E. Koi, where we're going next, or where we already are on this slide here, with this uh, corner on the other side of the Mauka side, of, of that side of the mall of the P.E. Koi side, uh, all by the same architects, Solomon Cortwell Buens, and they are from the same city as Ginny Gang is, and that is Chicago. And it's probably undoubtable uh, that um, the city in the United States that's considered to be the cradle of modern high-rise architecture is that town, is that city of Chicago, because you have Louis Sullivan, you have Frank Lark Wright, uh, you have Mies van der Rohe um, uh, immigrated there and started and Lakeshore Drive Apartments is sort of a synonym of uh, high-rise uh, condominium residential towers. So they all come from there and others come there too. So on number two, the IAO, that's by, uh, that's by Bolin Savitsky Jackson, which is also a firm even further east on the mainland. So... Um, that um, is what maybe uh, these people up there uh, in the general or the specific public are criticizing when they're saying finally, uh, because the Soto, uh, we talked about it yesterday that I'm, you know, I'm having my 10th anniversary here soon in, in August. And I have mixed feelings about it because looking back, I have been here during the biggest boom since the mid-century, right, with the most yep. high rises popping up. And we, as we keep assessing, we have to say they're predominantly rather depressing. So again, we were there when this happened and we didn't prevent it. At least we have and we will continue to voice ourselves. But what is that good for if it doesn't change anything? So we applaud these people here who also speak up, uh, quoting there at the top left when they were saying, it is enough. The question is then, are high rises the problem? Because what else do you do with discuss, right? We don't have enough land. So sprawling is not an option either. You got to keep the country country and make the city a city. So we're saying it's how you make vertical dwelling as we propose stack lanai's. So it's how you make the high rises and not if you make high rises. That's our point correct. to be correct. continued correct. to discuss you know, in the future as we did in the past. Correct. So let's go to the next slide. 
because we find another Haole here, as you guys call the ones uh, who are not from here. Uh, and that is someone from actually from where I come from, from Europe originally, that's from Colas. He's from uh, the Netherlands, but he made his career in America, particularly in New York. And we're missing our uh, show partner, Ron Lindgren, who had in his uh, amazing way told us stories uh, about the content of the Delirious New York book that we're showing at number four at the top right um, in uh, this kind of ironic substance of the book. Um, sometimes um, I feel like uh, some architects um, should maybe stay with theory and not build. And in many cases of the Rancola's buildings, I'm sorry to say, I feel the same about him, um, especially when we see what's down there. And how do you feel about that, Pistoro? Well, there's a lot to say about this building, uh, which is a proposed building right now. This is not it, it, this is not a definite structure at all. Uh, like many of the other buildings in the Ala Moana Center, it is conjectural based on presumably the future of our rail system. However, this occupies this corner that we're going to be looking at, and it doesn't. One of the things that I want to point out is just in the next block is a building which fulfills a lot of the things that we think buildings should fulfill. It's from 1951. We're going to see it in just a, a few minutes and a few slides. But this building we're looking at doesn't do any of those things. Again, this is a plain glass structure. That is a box that's going to get hot when it's in the sun. It's also not a very large lot. So this is occupying every square inch of the property to push right out to the street to fill that up as much as possible to get the maximum use out of it. Uh, I'll say no more. Yeah, and our quick check on orientation and fenestration. Orientation macro is okay because it's running Malka Makai and doesn't block the sort of the macro wind flow. But fenestration wise, it's gonna hit the east and the west facades and it's doing something similar to the symphony building that's on Kapilani Boulevard at the corner of Ward Street. Um, that is sort of push and pulling, zigzagging, folding the glass facade, which isn't doing anything beyond trying to make it look more attractive. But as far as performatively, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. So that's really, uh, we only know from this article down there in the BIST journal that they selected Omas or Rem Kolhas to design the building. So we're basically suggesting, uh, who are we? Basically uh, throw this away, Rem, and start all over. Um, and why do I have confidence that that will work out uh, well? And before we leave the slide and we go there, we wanna maybe go to the very top left, show quote number one because the developer of this project we already know from very recent shows about the Lilia. This is Brookfield Properties. And once again, um, this is probably down there, the one that we're talking here uh, in, on the Al Moana area is certainly probably a more high-end development um, or probably not social housing, affordable housing, while the Lilia claims itself it will be. And that one at least has Lanai. So Rem, when you start all over, Please add these, uh, you know, so uh, important to us here uh, in Hawaii. That's our genetic codes is the Lanai living. So do that. So next slide. Why do I have confidence in that Rem can pull this? Start all over, DeSoto. Well, you were just visiting Portugal with your beautiful wife, Suzanne. And this is someplace she's familiar with because she lived there for a while as a teenager. And so she's able to guide you around and speak Portuguese. This is the uh, in the city of Porto, which you visited with her, which was filled with interesting buildings that you've sent me pictures of. And this is a concert hall. And it's got this uh, distinctive heart painted on the stairs. And this city happens to already have two, not star architects, let's say, but very accomplished and uh, award-winning architects. And when Rem went there, you said that he felt that presumably that he had to do his best work there. So this concert hall that you visited, you think is an excellent piece of, of architecture. So you know he's capable of doing it and we need to see that put into effect here, not just in Portugal. Yeah, exactly. And you see Suzanne down there at the bottom of the heart, agreeing on that one wholeheartedly. 
so to speak. So, so to speak, yeah. Speaking. <laughs> exactly. So the, the lesson of that is, Rem, uh, you're not looking at the recent crap that we unfortunately have to report on. But you're looking at what's just down the road. And just as a reminder, a few blocks diamond head of your building is a building that has the same orientation. And you can learn from its uh, fenestration if you do a little bit of your history um, uh, homework, which one should do if one comes to another place, right? And that is, once again, the Alamoana building, our favorite, before they stole its performative uh, feathery cape that kept it cool away from it and they need to give it back as some museums uh, you're getting the message the metaphor as some museums need to give back indigenous hawaiian art and they are to give it back to your museum so here uh, whoever stole this from it the owner the developer the maintenance people need to give it back but then again, that was then and now is now. So now you got to be able to do even better than uh, basically it was pretty good back then. So um, next slide that gets us to our missing uh, you know, team member, Ron, because this is the topic of Howley. So our point is basically doesn't really matter as you kindly say, DeSoto, with uh, you know, your culture. It doesn't matter where you guys come from but it matters what your mindset is. And if your mindset is like in, in, in line uh, with uh, our values, then you're welcome. But if you're not, then better get there. Otherwise, well, you know, Cook got then hit on his head. <laughs> he the lesson the hard way, right? When they really found out he wasn't God, they were thinking he might have been, right? So here is uh, one of Ron's pieces here. And reflecting on that one, Ron was sharing with us that at Killingsworth, his former boss, later business partner and friend, always wished he would have brought his architecture more to the masses, to the people, also to the little people, and not staying in um, luxury resort uh, architecture, which they did all over the work in a, in a world in a beautiful way. And Ron, you basically also being one of our most loyal viewers, thank you, Ron, because you in within the firm uh, pushed it to that the most, because this here, as we prefer to keep calling it the Waikiki Park Hotel, because that was his original name before it got turned into the gentrified and price upscaled Hale Puna as the sibling of your Hale Kolani, you had designed tropical exotic side ventilation, which we see on that center um, column picture there, which also the flush to the outside glass fenestration, uh, besides uh, the, the vertical easy breezy guardrail in front of it, by the way, um, also had a sliding door in addition to the one on the lanai. So you could do what we call side ventilation. On, upon renovation of the building, they took this away and they sort of to 50% more hermeticized it. So we're saying again, uh, at the next chance of whatever your remodeling intervals are, or might it be sooner? Because at one point, one of these hurricanes is going to hit us. And when you replace that, go back to the original. And I think it's, isn't it fair to say to Soda that we're saying again, uh, Ron uh, back then is still that raw model to look up to and to use as a mentor for all these star architects when they come here and speak to him literally and figuratively and, 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 and engage and immerse themselves in his uh, tropical exotic mindset. Right, and learn. Yeah. So next slide. Um, this is usually you're the, the your history uh, expert. So you are the owner of all the historic uh, documentation and material, but I want to live up to that and learn from you. So these are historic <laughs> pictures I contributed. I don't know yes, how, how old something must be to count as being historic. And what are we looking no, at? No, no. It, 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 and yeah, and history does not mean it happened to only 50 years ago or more. It's happening. We're living history right this minute. This is the same photograph, but you just change the exposure and you just change the contrast to give two totally different views. This is the central building, and this is one of the new apartments that's in the Ala Moana area. 
The picture on the left shows the construction fence with this brightly illuminated little window to look through to watch the construction through these decorative painted panels. But on the right, with the different uh, exposure in the background, you see our favorite Ala Moana building, the way it looks now, which is no longer having the uh, innovative louvers that it originally had. But now there's a hole through the building and there's that central building with a decorative hole through it that we're seeing things that we wish had been there. We're seeing that they had done things differently. We wish that they had done bigger lanai's, et cetera, et cetera, all the stuff that we keep talking about. So yeah, this is history because the central building is in existence now and it's no more uh, just a theoretical thing. It's actually there and it is what it is. Yeah, I'm taking a glimpse, not until now I actually see what continues to be my permanent background, which is the most bioclimatic, biophilic feature of Kapiolani Boulevard, is this monkey pot canopy. And you see this through, the, through that opening there. So how ironic is that? And taking a glimpse, again, how blind must you be to not see what, again, is next door and then do your homework because again, they placed uh, that the central on Moana 90 degrees turned, so blocking the macro uh, airflow. And then again, um, yes, the lanai's that they have, we have to give them that. Basically, to the south are shading, but there is too much. And actually, look at the look at the now. There is too small. But you guys go back and watch the show. If you see here, they basically. Uh, trying to um, make us want to believe that there was way more lanai's and extrusion in the facade than there actually is in the in the realized building, right? There's the BBs, yep. the big bedrooms yep. that we analyzed. Big bedrooms. You don't see them to that degree here. Uh, my, I, I always remember my professor that we remembered in, I think, last week, uh, who always said, I don't believe this model, it lies. So okay. that's what I'm recalling now here. That's what I would say, being a professor <laughs> now myself. That model is right. lying here. You were, right. you were promising us something that you didn't fulfill, which is like right, right. It's so either a model or a rendering, but it can lie. Yeah, it's not the real thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a digital model. You're right. That's a digital model. So let's go back to Rem's side and uh, talking about what. Uh, is there, um, what's there currently, let's look at that. And that's also, um, you know, one of my favorite places is the Cho Dang restaurant in the back there. It's not only my favorite, but also my emerging generations who you kindly visited at the rehearsal for their today's uh, final review that Jay kindly will be part of. And we hopefully gonna share with everyone uh, soon uh, on this channel here. And this is the Cho Dang restaurant. And they're very kindly, cutely, once I told them that this is my favorite on their way to school, where they have to carpool from uh, Kalihi. And that's where they unfortunately share their flu bug with, uh, which put them out. So you guys get better. Before this happened, and we all reunited in studio after we were returning, they very nicely brought me and fed me with my favorite uh, kimchi stew that we will see in a minute. So that's the center. And the next slide, um, I got my hopes up a little bit too high because the developer in his recent uh, uh, redevelopment or refurbishing, he was going for a theme that um, made me believe it is the original, uh, my Americana favorite 70s, uh, 72 Plymouth Fury. However, here we put the gremlin in there uh, or the, uh, the, the AMC Pacer that as the metal is shiny on the other continent, um, the show with, with Ron, he taught us that uh, that car is made more favorite. Talking Dutch architect, he is Rem's colleague, Rika Doubledam, and her favorite own AMC Pacer, that the way more, we're fetishizing the way more than where they are from uh, uh, the United States of America. So this is yeah. not from the 70s originally, you had to teach me, right? Correct, that's right. This is actually a, a strip mall that replaced a gas station and it was built in the 1980s, but the facades that you're looking at now that you really liked and the, the curved uh, portions of the building on the facades actually are a later 
rendition or a later remodeling. So it's kind of retro, intentionally retro, not original as you had hoped and uh, fantasized it was. Yeah, we're almost at the end of another exciting 20 minutes, but sit, let's mouth water even more with our kimchi soup. So let's get up the next slide because here it is. But besides being yummy, uh, also there's a part of inclusivity uh, that's um, inherent to that side because now they have to adjust the price to everything getting more recession, everything getting a little bit more expensive, but it's still rather affordable. It used to be under 10 bucks. It's really, really delicious. That kimchi stew and these side dishes there and affordable. And so uh, next and final slide, uh, looking at it from coming out of the mall, we see this urban nomad here. And this urban nomad, again, is part of that scenery, is part of that situation. So once again, uh, when these sites get redeveloped, once is the question, how does it get re redeveloped environmentally? But the other question is, how does it get changed and remodeled socially? And both are very critical here on our islands. And with that, I guess we have to leave it uh, with that. Uh, hope to see you next week. We will continue with this here, or we squeeze in uh, the uh, tent segregity reparadizing of the emerging generation <laughs> that you get yourself very excited about as Ron had, um, as well as Bundet. So we will see, but we will, we will continue this one here. And until then, uh, also stay very inclusively tropical and tropically inclusive. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.